we're going to do is actually look at a couple of, um, of the, the models from the days. Uh, before we get into that, we're going to look at the last chapter. So there's five chapters, and um, uh, the last one is simply titled Extra Credit. And I think that's a, <clears throat> a good description um, of what's going on in Chapter 5. <clears throat> These are like bonus points. This is stuff that um, is really, really valuable that if you can add it into your life, you're going to go, wow, why didn't, I, why, did, why didn't I do that sooner? So extra credit. Uh, he says, um, he starts off this chapter, I would like to show uh, three activities that can help one develop and he, uh, you need your glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I have a pair in every room. I would like to share. Through, you know, I, I really hate that. You, the thing is, if I don't wear contact lens, I can see great up close. But if I have my contacts in, I don't know what it is. So anyway, the funny thing too, it's not even in the lesson. It has nothing to do with it. My doctor told me, when I was 45, he said, do you need reading less? So, oh, no, I don't. I see fun. And he's like, he said, well, you will. I said, I, said, I, don't, I don't think so. My eyes are great. He said, how old are you? 45. He said, yeah, you will. And I'm not, not exaggerating. Just within a couple of weeks, everything started getting blue. All right, let's start all over. Extra credit. I would like to share three activities that can help you develop an even more intimate prayer life and deeper relationship with God. Emphasis on intimate and deeper. These three things will move your prayer life beyond the basic steps we have shared thus far. But don't feel pressured to implement all of them right away. Take your time. Establish your set time, set place, and start to use your Bible reading plan and prayer patterns. When you feel ready to stretch yourself a bit more, consider these extra credit activities. So one of the things that I've loved about this um, teaching time is that we've really learned um, there's different seasons of life, there's different stretches of life, um, there's different schedules and demands. If we went around this room, every single one of us would have um, a different scenario and uh, the demands that are placed upon the hours that we work, the hours of free time that we have. Some of us are retired, and the way I understand it, when you're retired, that means you never do anything, right? <laughs> oh man, I was hoping so. <laughs> sounds like, yeah, sounds like it. That's not the case. Uh, but um, in all seriousness, um, we, each of us we face different demands. We have different responsibilities. And so what I'm hoping to come across is how incredibly important it is for us to make a, our prayer life a high, high number one priority in our lives. And that's going to look different for me than it will for you. But you will know in your heart if you have made it a, a high priority. And um, it's incredibly, incredibly important um, so important that sirens are going off in the next room. <laughs> um, here's, some, here's some of these bonus activities, and uh, let's just talk through them for a moment. First one is keep a record of answered prayer. Um, I had someone one time say that God answers prayers in three ways. Maybe you've heard this, and I don't know if this is exactly right, but I, I think it's pretty close. Um, God either answers yes or no or not yet. Which means no. No, it means not yet. It doesn't mean no. It means not yet. And um, so... Um, but here's what I think about that. Well, first, let me make this statement. Sometimes God's answer is no. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And sometimes we just do not want to hear no. That's right. 
And we just keep on and on, and we're kind of like that nagging kid. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Sometimes God is saying no. Sometimes He's saying, just wait, just trust me, stay faithful. Your desire is pure. Your what you're requesting is noble and it's honorable. But not yet. Not yet. Now, here's the only thing that. And maybe some of you are already thinking this with me. Um, what I just said about answered prayers, it presumes that that prayer means asking and and that there's a yes or a no on the other end of it. And I don't I don't think that that's the only way to define prayer. And actually sometimes I am asking God. I don't even know what I'm asking. Um, Romans 8, 27, the Spirit intercedes through us, 26, intercedes through us with utterances that we have no words for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the Holy Spirit knows how to pray things in, in and through us. And sometimes there's this, I don't know, it's just a longing, it's an ache, a yearning, and and it stays and um, so but but I would think I would say by and large that's a, a good statement answer prayers well let me ask you what do you think about it? interact with a yes no or maybe later on what any other thoughts about that answer prayers any comments maybe later on maybe later on yes yeah. when it's maybe later on that's when you have to pray for patience. <laughs> okay. And you pray for patience right now. I want to right now. No. Um, that's a good point, Paulette. Yeah. Yes. Uh-huh. Well, the most important things I think I learned from God was to pray for the prayer is to expect. Expectation is so incredibly important. Sometimes we pray and then we forget all about it. Mm -hmm. We don't know if God answered it or not. <laughs> yeah. So, Pat, you know... God has been reminding me lately of that very thing that, and I guess maybe it's not with me about expectation so much, but about being um, laser focused in prayer, like not just not praying it with, with any distractions, but being totally, absolutely committed to, to the relationship with Him and Sort of, I guess what the picture that I have that comes to mind is how, how annoying is it when you're talking with someone and they're kind of going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I've been guilty of that. I mean, a lot of times pastors are guilty of that because you have like, you've got a 30 minute window of seeing people and, and oh, I got to talk to that person that way. I won't be able to see them next time. And, um, but, how horribly annoying would that be? And thank you for sharing that. To expect that he will answer, that he really will. Yeah, dear. You remember uh, David Hall at the network conference? Mm -hmm. when, toward the end of his message, when he was praying for somebody, he was trying to get out. Mm -hmm. And the one lady was like, is that it? Is that it? And he says, as far as she came to him in prayer, her prayer to expect. Yes. Very good, dear. David Hall uh pastor from, from Australia and he was sharing how he had, had a full weekend and, and was really wiped up. John, just like what you're talking, prayed with lots and lots of people, just like, like you did on, on Sunday. But, uh, but David was saying, you know, I, I was kind of doing the exit prayer, like lay a hand to your pray and then kind of do the pivot and well, okay, have a good day. You know? <laughs> and, because I was so tired, and she stopped and said, is that it? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. No more of those. No more of those. Um, I think it is important to remember when God answers prayer, and the next thing that we'll talk about will help us with that, but how, how ungrateful would you think your child, your grandchild, like if, if they were asking you for something and you gave it to them and they just said and never even acknowledged 
what you had done. How would you feel? How must God feel when maybe we've been praying and praying and praying and hoping and hoping and then He answers prayer. We need to be like that one leper who returned to say thank you. Yeah. 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 Do any of you record answered prayers? Um, I see a couple of you nodding and hands going up. It, does anyone want to share about that? Like, you have, do you actually write them down, or how do you? Okay, um, we're going to talk about for a moment journaling. Easy for you to spell journal, journaling. Um, I was challenged to keep a journal. In 1993, um, no, 1994, when Zach was six months old, I began journaling. Um, Jeff Leak has a, a great section in here about journaling. And uh, in fact, let's just talk about this for just a moment under point two, where he says to start a journal. Um, he uses the soap method from Wayne Cordero. Um, soap stands for scripture, observation, application, prayer. So um, Jeff Leake, his practice is to, to have an eight and a half by 11 notebook, which is notebook paper, and he keeps his journal that way. He, he specifically says that he does not write more than one page every day, but that's the limit. Only one page. That way he's more inclined to actually write, and it doesn't feel like a huge burden, but he writes um, a record of, of prayer and in his interaction. Um, my journal, and there's no right or wrong for journaling. Mine is not like that. Mine is, um, I don't journal every single day. Um, but when I do write, I write sometimes lengthy entries, sometimes it's just one paragraph. Um, to date, I think I've got somewhere around 36 of those uh, little spiral notebooks that are about this size. You know those I'm talking about? You, I keep them cheap. I don't, I don't use the nice leather bound from Focus on the Family, you know. <laughs> Those are beautiful, but I'd rather get the ones that cost 98 cents at the store so I can not worry about how many of them I use, I just I write. And here's what I found. It is amazing to go back and read the track record of the faithfulness of God. How faithful He is. I really, really recommend it. Uh, for you. If some of you in the room, probably a lot of you do keep a journal of some sort. And there's all kinds of different ways and methods. But I really encourage you even to just jot down little notes to yourself and just do that over a, a period of time. Um, for me, I'm, I know you are much better than I am, but I have a bad memory. I'll go back and read things and I'll go, Goodness, I had forgotten about that. God, you were so faithful. You carried us through that. You're going to carry us through this, too. I mean, that's what it does for me. And uh, now, my journaling, I, um, I made a pact with God that I wasn't writing for other people to read it, that I was writing for my eyes only. I made a pact that I would be as painfully honest with myself as I possibly could be. And that um, sometimes it is gut-wrenching to read some of the things. Um, sometimes I'm writing super spiritual stuff that's deeply theological. And then sometimes I'm writing about my son's basketball game. Or, you know, it's all over the place. Sometimes it's, it's what God spoke to me from His Word. Sometimes it's the family trip. It, it can be anything. But in all of it, I've seen God's faithfulness. And I, I really encourage you to do it. 
Some of you who do keep notes or journals or some of those things, would you just speak to this for a moment? Can you tell us a way that it has benefited you? Any, anyone want to share a little bit about that? Yeah, Joanna. Um, how, it's, how it has helped me is uh, I had a tough life when I was young. And uh, my father was an alcoholic. When I was a senior in high school, um, at the same time, I was going to beauty college for Nell Tech. And there at college, I met a girl that she was Christian. And all the time that I was heading the bad, bad, bad side, bad side, uh, she always would lift me up and tell me, Miss Joanna, you need to start, you know, getting close to God. And I never, I would never, li you know, I wouldn't listen to her at that time. Like, but um, as at, at still going to high school and my dad being an alcoholic, I started a journal. And that's how I would let all my feelings out. Mm -hmm. Lost that on that journal. And at the same time, I didn't realize that that was my way of talking to God. Because wow. like you said, you go back. Yeah. I would go back. And a lot of it in there in my journal, and this is 1995 when I started this. I would I would go back to read them, and then in there in some parts, it would say, Jesus, why do I go through this? Why do you let me go through this? Yeah. And I, you know, and I didn't realize, I didn't, you know, realize, but <coughs> he has always been there for me. Yeah. So I think I have like maybe 20 journals now, like full, and I have them all like in a rubber band, and I have a new one now. And, and it becomes so a treasure to you. It, it, it does. When, like, when we moved one about. time, I, I was sincerely afraid that, that I lost my journals. I mean, I, I thought they were yeah. gone out for six months, and when I found them, I was ecstatic. Stephanie heard, whoa! <laughs> I was just as excited as when she lost her wedding ring for nine months. That's how it's <laughs> the, the journal. Um, but for me, and you said something so important, when, when you journal, um, feelings have a way of getting expressed in that paper. And for me, here's what I found out. Thoughts that I can't quite wrap my head around, it just sort of clinks around in here and it finds its way down to the ink pen and I scribble it out and, and then I go, that's what I was trying to express. So maybe it's something that works for you. Maybe not. Some of you would just say, man, that's not me. I don't care about that. would never do that. That's okay. You know, <laughs> Beth? Uh, there was a lady at the home where I work, Evelyn Rounds, and she journaled. Mm -hmm. And she had been journaled. She was 97. Oh, wow. And she had her daughter bring up several of her journals. And she had to show them to me. Oh, and amazing. they were a treasure to her. Absolutely. Oh, she was a she was a beautiful lady. Oh, fantastic! And it did encourage me to journal, but I think I'm a sanguine. <laughs> I, I, I keep writing notes and all this stuff. I mean, I, I don't know. I just uh, um, we all I, yeah we I all just don't have seem our, to have time. Well, that's probably part of it. Yeah. Well, that, that's true because to write something down, it does it does take a little bit of time commitment. Yeah. So, um, all right. Um, I need to start. He talks about prayer partner, and I guess in a, a really in the sense of either a prayer partner or a small group. The idea behind this is accountability. Um, I have a, a friend that um, lives out of state. Um, we're close friends. I mean, he has called me before. I have called him. And it, it could be one of those middle of the night kinds of things where if I just called and said, you know, Cordell, I, I really need you to agree with me. Boy, I would not hesitate calling him mm -hmm. two in the morning. 
and I hope that he feels the same way with me. I mean, we need somebody in our lives that we can agree with and that can hold us um, accountable. And uh, besides the accountability thing, just the, the sheer fact that when you have, uh, there, there is power in numbers. And the Bible speaks about the power of agreement. And so when you have a prayer partner, you have just elevated the effectiveness of, of prayer. Um, there's two things that have to happen in prayer. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Somebody earlier was saying that, maybe it was about the expectation, Pat, when you were saying that. When we pray, um, when God hears a righteous person praying and seeking his face, he is listening and he wants to meet that need. Righteousness is imparted to us. It's imputed to us because of Christ Jesus. It's not us being good enough. That I want to be clear about that. But we also are people who believe in holy living. We believe in holiness, practicing living our lives under the conviction of the power of the Holy Spirit and being led by Him. And when a person is in right standing with God, there is no known sin that needs to be confessed, everything's confessed, they're in relationship with Him, and they are fervent and expecting and they're praying, then that's that's powerful. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. One translation, that kind of prayer does some good. Yes, it does. That kind of praying does some good. Now, when you take two people like that, and you bring them together in agreement, that's powerful. And uh, how much more when you get an entire room of people? I, I don't, I can't even uh, remember if I shared this um, about um, um, Charles Spurgeon. His name slipped me for a moment. Maybe you've heard this before, but the great British pastor, C.H. Spurgeon, had someone touring his building and he said, would you like to see our prayer, uh, would you like to see our furnace room? I kind of gave the kicker away, would you like to see our power, our furnace room? And he, he said, sure, you know. And he said, this is where all the power comes from for our church. And he had seen all the facilities and they walked downstairs in the basement, opened the door, and there were approximately 50 people on their face praying. And he said, they always pray when I preach. This is where the power comes from for our, for our church. Now, yeah, the power of agreement. Um, so I agree, uh, answered prayer, write it down. Some way, somehow, find a way. Uh, journal, if that's you, if it fits. You know, you might give it a try. I, the way I found out that I like to journal is I was forced to for an assignment in a class I had to do for 30 days. And I went in griping, and I came out going, wow, this is pretty amazing. So you might be the same way. Um, prayer partner, pray that God will give you a prayer partner, someone that you can truly, that you can agree with him for any, any request. We're going to shift gears and actually go to uh, Psalm 103. But before we do that, is there anything else that you would that you would say? And, and by the way, not super super spiritual, but just practical kinds of things like this. I mean, writing down that God has answered prayer, or writing down about prayer. Anything else that comes to mind that's just everyday kind of stuff that hey, this would help the group. Anybody? Okay, well, let's let's take a look at, um, see, which day is it in here that he talks about? Psalm 103. I think it's page 108. Um, you know what? Uh, here's, I didn't realize that we have taken up this much time, but maybe I'll just do it this way. I want you guys to hear the testimony of, um, 
pull this up for just a moment. So if, if you've never heard the testimony of Pastor Dwayne Miller, um, I was actually talking with John the other day at the barbecue, was over at Oliver's house, about this, about this testimony, um, Psalm 103. And this is an amazing testimony. It will encourage you. So what we'll do, we'll end by listening to about five minutes of this testimony. And then uh, next week when we come back, come back together, we'll pick up on page 108, which talks about Psalm 103. And they knew how much I needed the outlet. I needed to teach. So I said, okay, and I started trying to teach again. The class began to grow. My voice continued to get weaker. By the end of 1992, my voice was so weak that if I tried to leave a message for you on your telephone recorder, it would hang up on me and didn't know anybody was on the other end of the line. Literally, when I would finish teaching for 45 minutes on Sunday morning, I would be wringing wet from my t-shirt all the way through my suit coat. That's not a joke, nor is it an exaggeration. I would go home on Sunday afternoon absolutely, totally spent. I had nothing left. But I got to tell you, while that made my throat sore, my spirit was soaring. By the end of 92, voice is horribly weak. I'm wearing the headset. I told our director, I said, look, I've got a couple of weeks left. And that's it. I have got to step away, guys. I can't do it anymore. I just can't do it. January the 17th came, 1993. And I was, I was going to be there one more Sunday after that Sunday. That was, that was my next to last Sunday. The class did not know that. The director's church administration knew that I was going to step down. The class didn't know that. Our lesson that day was from Psalm 103. And Psalm 103 was our lesson that morning, or the heart of it. That's where David says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And then he starts to list them. He forgives all my sin. He heals all of my disease. He redeems my life from the pit, the grave, destruction. He crowns me with love and compassion, loving kindness. And he satisfies my mouth, my desires, with good things, so that my youth is renewed like the eagle. Well, that's a pretty good outline. Pretty easy to follow those. So I started teaching that morning, and I told the class that one of the greatest joys is to know that the sacrifice that Jesus made on Calvary is for all my sin. I went and looked up the word all in Aramaic, Hebrew, and Greek. You know what that word all means? Every last one without exception. Now, either God through Jesus Christ has forgiven all of our sin, or Calvary was a sham. There's nothing in between. He doesn't forgive all your sin up to the time that you say, Jesus, come into my heart. And then it's touch and go after that. I went to the second thing. The second point says, and he heals all of my disease. Now I'm going to look up that word, all. You know what that one means in that phrase? Every last one without exception. All. He heals all of my disease. Now that's either true or it's not. There aren't any half-truths with God. Here I stand telling these precious people that you still heal. Listen to me. And I move to the next phrase. The next phrase says that he redeems my life from the pit. Now that was a particularly meaningful phrase and you, and you need to understand why. Two days before, I had sat in my living room with a shotgun in my mouth, prepared to pull the trigger. I could not find anything to do to be gainfully employed. I had written a couple of books that I thought would sell. I sent them off to Christian publishers that I knew. And on that Friday, I had received letters from my publishers telling, the, telling me that they would not be able to publish for me because with the loss of my voice, I couldn't go out and promote the book. And I didn't have name recognition of a Chuck Swindoll or a Charles Stanley. And the only way they could recoup investment was a book tour, and I couldn't do it. So therefore, they wouldn't be able to publish for me. Last hope. At that point, I'm drained on my family. I don't know what we're going to do. I don't know how we're going to survive. And I went home, and I put a shotgun in my mouth. And I sat there for hours. People have said, why didn't you pull the trigger? Answer, grace of God. I don't know. I was in one, and I had you there with me shortly. 
<laughs> and I started to talk about the pit. But I never got to finish the part about the pit. Because just as I began, God intervened in that room. And this is what He did instead. On the other hand, to say that, since we don't have anything after the book of Acts, that miracles ended at the book of Acts and they never happen again, is equally as wrong. Because you have put God in the box both ways. He doesn't want to be in the box. So, the psalmist says, I am excited. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. One of his benefits is he heals all of my diseases. And then verse 4 he says, and he redeems my life from the pit. Now, I like that verse just a whole lot. I have had, and you have had in times past, pit experiences. We've both had, we've all had times when our life seemed to be in a pit, in a grave. And we didn't have an answer for the pit we find ourselves in. And I don't understand this right now. sovereignty too is so incredibly beautiful that God took his voice away and of all times to choose to restore his voice right at that precise moment power so um, um, God's a healing God yes, he is. and when we pray we, we pray on purpose we mean business we expect him to answer prayer we never um, we don't own God he's not a cosmic slot machine where we pull the arm and we expect it. You've got to do things our way because we can never put God in a box. He will never be figured out. If you can put God to a formula, then He ceases to be God. He is God. That's right. But very often, 
He just loves his kids so much, and he just says, watch this. <laughs> um, wow. So we'll, we'll start by reading Psalm 103 when we come back together next week. Let's, uh, let's bow our heads. I've gone a few minutes over, but that's okay. Father, thank you for the chance that we've had to be together tonight. I find so much encouragement from the words of others. Thank you for this group. It's special, Lord. Every individual in this room is just amazing. I thank you for their lives. I pray for their protection and their well-being. I ask that you show your favor to them. Thank you for this incredible testimony from Pastor Dwayne Miller. Um, all these years later, is still blessing so many people. Lord, help us not to forget all of your benefits. I just ask that you would help us to be Psalm 103 type believers uh, who walk very close to you. Heal all our diseases. Redeem our lives from the pit. Restore our youth like the eagle. Blessed be the name of the Lord, both now and forevermore. Go with us from this place, God, and um, bring us safely to your house again this this coming Sunday on Mother's Day. Let it be an incredibly special day for each of our mothers, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.